the do-it-yourself guide to business buying. Today, we're talking about screening deals, specifically deal fit. Welcome, business buyers. What is our goal with this video, screening deals and deal fit? Well, in the first video we did on screening, we talked about screening deals three different ways. We talked about screening the transaction, screening the seller, and screening the business. Today, we're talking about the first one. We're talking about the transaction and deal fit, answering that all-important question, is this deal closable as an LBO? LBO, of course, meaning leveraged buyout, buying a business with mostly borrowed money. We want to avoid wasting time on deals that are unlikely to close. And to do that, we need to understand what makes an LBO work. So I've created a 10-item LBO deal fit checklist that's specific to small Main Street LBO type deals, revenue less than 10 million, in most cases less than five. I'm going to be using the Likert scale instead of just a straight yes, no checklist. We'll see how that works in a second. In fact, I'm going to explain how it works with a nonsensical example. Let's assume that when you're doing LBOs, it really helps if the seller likes Hawaiian pizza. And depending upon the evidence, we score it accordingly. And that's what we're going to do for each checklist item. Of course, we have to base it on evidence, evidence we collect to score the item. And if the seller had Hawaiian pizza for lunch and raved about it, we'd put that up as five, strongly agree. I'm going to do the exact same thing for all 10 LBO screening criteria. Let's go through them. Let's get started. What helps make an LBO work? Well, for one thing, an ask price that is fair or realistic. So let's start there with ask price. Our financial motivation for owning a business is generating cash flow for ourselves out of the earnings of the business. We also want to build some equity in that business over time. That is challenging to accomplish if we overpay for the business. So we have to ask ourselves, how big is the starting gap between the market value of the business, what it's worth, and what the seller is asking for? Obviously, the smaller the gap, the better chance we have of closing this LBO. So we take a look at market price, we take a look at the ask price, and then we determine how big the gap is and whether it's closable or not. This one looks fairly tight and closable. If it's a large gap, that's a long shot to close. We avoid taking long shots. They just don't pay off. Now, not all deals have an ask price, so we still have to piece together how big a potential gap there is. When it comes to evidence for this particular deal, the ask price is within the historical min-max range. We do have historic comparables available to make the comparison. And so valuations are always a range. And when we take a look at the range in terms of where this business ought to be, it's within that range. It's just at the high end or the max end of that market price range. And for that reason, I probably wouldn't give it a five, but I would give it a four. The price in this particular case is in our favor and makes for a more closable LBO. Next, cash flow to service acquisition debt. Let's look at cash flow. A target business needs enough cash flow to pay, number one, the principal and interest on bank debt, and number two, the principal and interest on the seller note. I mean, turnarounds, they don't make for good LBOs. If you want to do an LBO, it requires a target business that is cash flowing. Now, at the screening stage, we're making a rough estimate only. In terms of cash flow, we haven't done any detailed future projections yet. But based upon the historical, we take a look at the evidence, and at first glance, the cash flow looks strong for this business. We've got great year-to-year -year consistency. The debt service ratio is good. We'll talk more about that in the financial analysis video. But all in all, yeah, cash flow is a plus for this deal as an LBO. I'm giving it a five. Next, assets that we can borrow against. Let's take a look at assets. Are there assets on the balance sheet of the target business that we can borrow against for the purposes of making a closing payment? The big three are typically accounts receivable, fixed assets, and inventory. And if they're free, clear, and unencumbered, all the better. Now, if you look at the screening evidence for this deal, there are some assets on the balance sheet of this target business that we could borrow against. The problem is, not much. The closing payment would be really modest. Mind you, the assets are unencumbered which is always nice. Not too many LBO practitioners are gonna get excited about a balance sheet that allows you to make a closing payment of 10% or less. And so for that reason, I'm kind of neutral on this one. I'm gonna score it a three. Next, we have free access to the seller. Let's talk a little bit about access. If this is a broker deal, there are brokers who will restrict your access to the seller, which makes it very difficult to arrange a seller note. The seller has to know, like, and trust a buyer to negotiate a significant seller note. That's hard to do if you're not getting access to the seller. So we need to take a look at the deal and see what evidence is out there. And based on our experience so far, this is going to be problematic. The access to the seller has been very limited. We've only had one short discussion with the seller. This can definitely matter. So if we're not getting access, 
That is a red flag for sure. I'm scoring this one a two. Next, a seller can provide on-demand financials. Let's take a look at this one. Before lending, lenders want to see the financial statements printed from accounting software, number one. Number two, financial statements that are current, that are on-demand. And number three, financial statements from the previous three years. Not all Main Street businesses can deliver. And I'm specifically focused on number two, and that is if you ask for a balance sheet, can they produce one? If it's going to take them four to six weeks and they can't produce on-demand financial statements, you're going to run into a lot of roadblocks when you're dealing with a lender. So we take a look at the evidence in this deal. The financials look good. There are some gaps, but they're fixable. They've been very responsive in providing information when asked. And all financials are up to date, and we have requested them more than once. So all in all, that's a strong look. I'm going to score this one a four. Next, legacy is important to the seller. Let's talk about legacy. What is the connection between legacy and closability anyway? Well, if I can convince the seller I'm the best person to protect their legacy, they're more likely to accept my seller note, and I'm more likely to close this as an LBO. Now, what does legacy mean to the seller? As a broad category, it means that the seller cares about what happens to the business and the people that work there. Sometimes it's just about maintaining the name on the business. They know a trade buyer won't maintain that name long term. Sometimes they want to protect valued employees. Sometimes it's to serve customers with the same products and services. They know a trade buyer would rationalize the product mix and stop selling things that are important to the community. Sometimes they just want to preserve their reputation in their hometown. Point is, legacy matters to some sellers. Not all, but for some it's very important. They know that if a trade buyer acquires the business, the business is likely to be folded into the parent in the short or medium term and will eventually cease to exist. In this particular deal, the seller has made it crystal clear. Preserving legacy is the most important thing. They want to sell to the right person. Sometimes that's code language. A seller who wants to sell to the right person is a pretty good indicator that legacy is important. For all of these reasons, I think I would score this one strongly agree, which is great news for us as buyers if we can preserve that legacy and convince the seller that we're the right person to do that. Next, the seller MUD score is high. Let's take a look at MUD score. MUD score is a metric that I devised years ago, and it's designed to deal with two really important questions. Number one, is the business really for sale? And number two, is the seller flexible enough to do a max leveraged buyout type deal? The MUD score can give us a quick read on both of those. What does MUD stand for? Well, there's motivation, that's the M, urgency, and distress. That applies, of course, to the seller, not to the business. Motivation measures the desire to sell. How convicted is the seller that they're going to sell that business? The unmotivated to me are people who will sell if the price is high enough. They don't get motivated until they're in a situation where they're going to sell at the best price they can, but one way or another, they're selling the business. That's the kind of motivation we're looking for. Distress, the seller has a concrete reason for selling. It could be family breakdown, it could be moving away, or it could be family illness or death. The seller needs, not wants, but needs to sell the business. That's distress. And of course, urgency, selling is time sensitive in a way it has a due date. The consequences of not selling can be significant. For example, forced liquidation could be one likely alternative if we don't sell the business. So whenever there's urgency there, we like to note it. If we had a seller who was highly motivated, under pressure to sell, and in a hurry, I think we could be pretty confident that our two important issues were addressed. Yes, this business is really for sale. And number two, we have a flexible seller. In terms of this deal, we take a look at the evidence. And this is a retirement sale, which means the motivation is only middling. When people are retiring, they usually have runway. And if they get a good offer, they will sell. And sometimes they're quite eager but not necessarily any distress or urgency. And no sense of distress was noted in this deal and no urgency was noted either. So for that reason, I'm kind of neutral on it. I score this one as a three. Next, has the business been for sale longer than six months? It turns out that it matters how long the business has been on the market. The longer it's been on the market, the more flexible the seller becomes. And a flexible seller is great in two different ways. Number one, they're more realistic on the asking price. And number two, they're more open to negotiating a seller note. So seller flexibility is key in a max leverage LBO. What about this deal? Well, this business has only been on the market for six weeks. They haven't received any offers yet, and the seller and broker are still very optimistic that they're going to get their ask price. So all in all, this is not a strong point for this deal at all. This is someone who's still got some pretty high expectations on what their business is worth. They're only getting started. 
probably not a great candidate for us to be putting in a max leverage, all seller note type deal if that's our plan. And that's exactly why we're going through this checklist is to pick up on stuff like that. This item by itself, of course, is not going to be determinative, but it's something we definitely want to keep in mind. Next, business fundamentals are still good. Let's take a look at fundamentals. Does this business still make sense? Are customers still attracted to their value package? Have the margins held up? Or maybe the business is suffering from benign neglect. It's on autopilot. Nobody is tending to the store, so to speak. If that's true, I like that in an LBO because we can fix benign neglect. Lots of times, owners just are cash flowing their business, treating it as a cash cow pre-retirement. Nothing wrong with that. We just want to know up front. If we take a look at the evidence in this deal, the business has grown by word of mouth. They don't do sales or marketing. They're not even taking on new customers at all. I find that situation to be true more often than you would think. Gross margins have been extremely stable over time. Yeah, the fundamentals of this deal are clearly excellent. I'd score this one. Strongly agree. Next, let's take a look at the seller wanting to exit the business. Do we want a seller who sells the business, then we don't see them anymore? Or do we want a seller that hangs around? Well, not everybody agrees with me on this one, and it's certainly different if you have a cash offer. But if you're putting together a deal that's mostly a seller note, in my experience, sellers do not want to hang around and then pay off their own seller note. Why would they want to generate cash flow for three or four years so that at the end of that period, someone else owns their business? I mean, the seller's thinking, if I'm going to be here anyway, I might as well continue to own the business. So in my mind, if they have plans to exit the business, that's a big plus for me. Now, it is a bigger transition issue, but if they're willing to leave and also negotiate a significant seller note, now, I like that particular combination. Now, the evidence in this case, the seller definitely wants to exit, wouldn't stay if asked, and wants a clean break as soon as possible. So I'm definitely scoring that one a five on my checklist. I like it when the seller wants to give the keys to somebody and exit the business. So we source a new deal from our generating deal flow type activities, and we're wondering, would this make a good LBO? We now have a 10 item checklist we can use to help answer that question. And even without numerically scoring them, I think the questions themselves are a great starting point on their own. Let's say Target Co. A is a brand new business and we're going through the questions. Starting with price, is it fair or realistic? Second, cash flow, is there enough to service the acquisition debt? Assets, are there enough assets to borrow against for a closing payment? If it's a broker deal, do we have free and open access to the seller? Can the seller provide on-demand financials? Does the seller value the legacy of the business? Is the MUD score high? Is motivation, urgency, and distress impacting the seller? Are the business fundamentals still good? Has the business been for sale for longer than six months? And does the seller want to exit the business after they sell? Now, of course, we did take it an extra step. We did the Likert scoring, one to five. I won't go through them all again because we already discussed them. But when we went through them individually, this is the way they scored. If we take a look at them all at once and we're asking about deal fit and wondering, is this a closable LBO? If we add them up, we get 38. There are 10 items. So if we average them, the deal fit score is 3.8. Well, what does a deal fit score of 3.8 out of 5 even mean? Well, we don't use deal fit score to predict success. That's not something I believe in. I think it's probably not accurate enough for that. In reality, not all items carry equal weight. But the deal fit score is much better for prioritizing time and effort. It's very handy in that capacity. Should we be spending time on a specific deal? And once we take a look at the deal fit score, that's going to help us make a good decision on prioritizing time and effort. To see that, let's take a look at a second deal. Let's call it Target Co. B. And with Target Co. B, we have the same 10 questions. We're going to score them out in the same way. I won't go through them one by one, of course. Let's assume it scores out that way. We're looking at deal fit. When we do the numbers, we get a total score of 20. We get a deal fit score of 2.0. Let's compare target A and target B. 3.8 for A, 2 for target B. Might be better to look at them side by side. And when we do that, yeah, A has 3.8, B has 2. When we take a look at the line items and the checklist, yeah, it's a little bit easier to see. And so then the question becomes really easy. If we're asking which deal should we prioritize, the obvious answer is A. It's a better deal than B when it comes to closability. So if we have a limited amount of time in a given week to spend on a deal, we want to spend it on A. And keeping our deal funnel nice and clean uh, is really important. And we don't want it cluttered up with all these zombie deals that we're still working, we're still devoting time to, that really don't have much of a chance of closing. And so this is a great tool to keep us on track. 
Sometimes we can look at clusters rather than the whole checklist. And those clusters can give us a strong green light or sometimes a strong red light. Let me give you an example. Let's say we're looking at random target co ABC, a deal that has appeared in our deal funnel. We go through our checklist, we score it out, and it looks like this. Quite a bit of variability there. Can we make any sense of it? Are there any patterns to pick up on it? Let me give you an example on how I would view a deal like this. I'd probably start with legacy. I really like sellers who value legacy, and this one does in a big way. They care about what happens to this business. They're also highly motivated to sell. In fact, there's motivation, urgency, and distress as well. It's been for sale for a while, longer than six months, maybe longer, and the seller has plans and wants to exit the business after they sell. So I take a look at those four together. The seller cares about his business, is highly motivated, has been trying to sell it for a while, but has really firm plans on what they want to do. Yeah, that's a priority bump. That's a strong cluster to me. I think that's an excellent starting point to potentially close this deal. Sure, I might have some problems with some of the other items down the road. You know, I'm not saying this is a guaranteed close, but it is a launch point for me to be prioritizing deal ABC over some of the other deals in my funnel. That's the point. And of course, sometimes it does go the other way. If we have random target co XYZ and we score that on our checklist, again, we get a pattern that seems to be all over the map. Is there anything we can take a look at in terms of pattern recognition? Well, here's how I would view this deal. I think, oh, there's a premium price here. That's not a great starting point. I'm having a hard time talking to the seller. I've got a really controlling broker who's throwing up lots of roadblocks. The seller's not very motivated. I'm not picking up anything on motivation, urgency, or distress. And the business has been newly listed. It's only been listed for three weeks. When I see those four together, to me, it's a definite priority drop. That's a pretty strong cluster, but it's in the negative direction. And so to me, that'd be a good time to push the pause button on this deal. I'm not necessarily rejecting it from my deal funnel altogether. Because of that last item, it's only been on sale for three weeks. Once this thing gets pushed out to six or eight or nine or 10 months, we might have both a seller and a broker who have a different mindset at that point. For now, I'm definitely pushing the pause button on this deal. I mean, picking up patterns becomes instinctive over time, but it's really helpful. We're always looking for an angle or an edge as a way to kind of maximize the time that we spend on our deals. Deal funnel management is extremely important and being able to screen out deals that are zombies, that are deals with a very low chance of closing that we continue to spend time and effort on needs to be a high priority. Let's sum it up this way. We talked about generating deal flow, which is feeding deals into our funnel in a previous video. Now we're talking about deal screening, where we open the gate to push a deal through our funnel or maybe kick the deals out of the funnel altogether or sometimes put them on pause. The reality is we never know what deal will close. Will it be the third deal we look at or the seventh, maybe the 19th, maybe the 32nd, maybe the 55th deal. But whenever it happens, we have to have the time and effort available to pursue that deal when it appears, which means we need to keep our deal funnel open, crisp, clean, and efficient. We have to eliminate all zombie deals. No zombie deals in our funnel. No deals in our funnel where we're still working the deal, we're still investing time and effort, even though there's almost no chance of closing that deal. It is ridiculously easy to get into a situation where we have multiple zombie deals in our funnel. But after watching this video, we know how to eliminate them. So let's get after it. This is the do-it-yourself guide to business buying. Today, we've been talking about screening deals and specifically deal fit. Always remembering that we want to learn and grow as we go. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.